to the Cold War Prepper. My name is Lee. Oh, my gosh. Look at my hair. Wow. Maybe I should uh, click on that button to see what I look like before I go live next time. But anyhow, welcome, welcome, welcome. It looks like we got three so far. Um, I guess Rebecca and Matthew and, and Clarity Jane. <clears throat> we, uh, we are beginning tonight the nuclear war survival skills uh, from um, Crescent Kearney. Great book. I, I, I bought the first edition back in 19, I want to say 1979 or 1980. Uh, I was at Field Station Augsburg in Augsburg, Germany. It came out at the Stars and Stripes, which is the military bookstore. And, oh, man, I devoured it. Um, I'll get it one, next week. I'll have it. And I'll show you tabbed and highlighted like you would not believe. Uh, but anyhow, just a phenomenal book. Um, it's very much in sync with everything we did back in the uh, Cold War, back in the days of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and stuff like that. So there's a lot of nuclear stuff in there. Uh, now, remember, we've got two PhDs who are basically involved in this book, and both of them are in nuclear uh, physics. So uh, I, I, I take it as being pretty close to gospel. Hello, Cheryl's Country Living. Welcome. Sue me. Welcome. Uh, always favorite. One of my favorite Canadians. Always great to see you. Uh, cats and Prepping. Welcome. Little Lone Prepper. Fantastic. Welcome. Welcome. Um, so... Uh, I just, just love the book. I mean, it, it is, in my opinion, <clears throat> one of the mandatory books that you need to have in your library. It's got some charts and everything that uh, is going to make it so important for you to have it <clears throat> in your library as a reference tool as well as a preparation guide. Now, let me scare you a little bit because I'm scared a little bit. Uh, so some interesting things have happened in the Middle East in just the last couple hours. Uh, a hospital was hit by a rocket or by something explosive in Gaza. Uh, the Israelis are saying they didn't do it, uh, that they think it was an errant rocket that was launched by the uh, Hamas. Hamas says, no, they didn't do it. It was a bombing by the Israelis. Of course, all of the uh, Islamic countries are blaming it on Israel. Nobody knows what really happened, but there were a lot of people who were killed in the in the. Uh, Explosion at the hospital. Turkey, Iran, Syria, Lebanon uh, are, are, are just up in arms. Egypt is up in arms. Uh, some of the countries, and I, I'm not going to say which one because I, I had it, and, and you know now I'm I, I would be speaking off the cuff. But uh, President Biden is flying to uh, the area expected to be there. Probably, you know, remember, they're eight hours ahead of us, so probably be landing here in the next couple hours. And uh, but uh, two of the countries that we scheduled to, miss, to meet with have canceled the appointment. They don't want to talk to them because of what happened at the uh, at the hospital. Hezbollah has been launching uh, anti-tank guided missiles, guided rockets uh, across the northern border into Israel. They, there have been several mortar attacks that has been met with counter mortar, counter mortar, counter battery fire. Uh, Syria has now joined in the attack and Syria is attacking the north of Israel as well. So we have both Lebanon and uh, uh, Syria attacking the northern borders of, of uh, Israel. We still have the complications of the West Bank and everything that could happen with Jordan. Uh, of course, Israel is no longer 100 uh, percent neutral as they have been. Turkey was neutral leaning Hamas. Uh, now they are very much leaning towards Hamas Hezbollah. So, and we know that Iran, of course, is the one who's got all this going. So everything is, is, is I mean, it's extremely tenuous. It, it could go up in, in a heartbeat right now. Uh, so uh, I would say, you know, stay close to your preps and uh, have a plan on what we're going to do. I think we'll, we'll expedite a little bit of information in this book just to uh, try to get you a little bit of extra information. So that's where we are as we enter into our Tuesday night uh, preparedness, post-apocalyptic, uh, non-fiction book club. So let me get my reading glasses. Oh, my gosh. Um, I guess I should clean those before we go into uh, a session. And, okay, reading glasses are on. It's what happens when you become old. You uh, 
you get this stuff down. So, so uh, basically the introduction, we're talking about self-help, civil defense. We're talking about a lot of the same stuff that we had back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, nuclear physics is nuclear physics. It doesn't change that much over time. Um, one of the things he says is that this book will never be out of date uh, because it's written on the fundamentals of um, uh, nuclear physics. The only reason more entities uh, on the planet do not have the weapon is because of the cost and the difficulty in making the source material for the weapon. We're talking about nuclear weaponry. <coughs> Plutonium does not exist in nature. It's made in a nuclear reactor, and the reactor currently runs on uranium-238 with enriched 235 levels in it. Making the 235, U-235, is slow and takes time and a lot of electricity. <coughs> It was done in WW2 at the ORNL. Um, I forget what OR stands for, something nuclear laboratory. Uh, because of the closeness of the Tennessee Valley Authority and its massive hydroelectric dams. According to the late Ed York, more energy was used in making 235 with electricity than was released from the bomb itself when the little boy was detonated over Hiroshima in the form of heat, blast, light, and radiation combined. Um, so basically, Hiroshima was a big water bomb. And he replied, you could look at it that way. Uh, falling water, hydroelectricity made of the U-235 from the U-238 to make the weapon capable of uncontrolled fission. So, you know, just... It, when you talk about, hello, Stuart's Prepping, welcome, Sandy Arend, welcome. So when you talk about uh, the complexity of making it, and, and still North Korea is trying uh, to get theirs perfected. Um, so, and, and when you get right down to it, really, uh, the Ukraine uh, affair that's currently ongoing is because of nuclear, possibility of nuclear warfare also. In 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, this, the, the, the uh, Russians call it uh, Stena Pazora, or the, the Wall of Shame. And then the Russians just called it the Mauer, the Wall. Uh, but when it fell and, and, and the Soviet Union fell, uh, each one of the Soviet socialist republics split off uh, from, um, from the Soviet Union. One of those Soviet republics was the Republic of Ukraine. And uh, at that time, Ukraine was where the vast majority of their weaponry was manufactured. Uh, it was the vast majority of their food production. It was also where they had the vast majority of their tactical nuclear weapons stored. So when, they, when that happened and the, and, and the Soviet Union fell, Ukraine became the third largest possessor of nuclear weapons in the world. So the United States and uh, you, the, the, at that time, the, the defunct USSR, now Russia, uh, signed an agreement called the Budapest Memorandum. And this was in 1995, I believe. But, oh, by the way, I, I do make mistakes. So, and, and I'm pulling that one out of my uh, long-term memory. So please feel free to correct. Last night, we had two fantastic catches uh, one of them was from uh, Phyoxerus, and he gave me something I'd never heard of before, and that was the, the uh, uh, memorial to FDR in, in Washington, D.C. I did not know it existed. And I looked it up, and wow, he said it's the ugliest memorial in, in D.C., and I agree from what I can see of it. The other one was uh, Michelle Mitten, Prepper Veteran, who said that, uh, according to Wikipedia, uh, General Dwight Eisenhower was the commander of the AEF, American Expeditionary Forces. I thought that the only American, the only time we called it AEF was in World War One, but you know it's right there in black and white. Wikipedia says that he was the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, which was World War Two. So uh, that was a good catch on her part. So uh, I, I I do accept um, corrections if if they are researched and they are logical and and uh, and everything else, you know and. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm now. If you're just making something up and trying to correct me with it, no, nah, I don't accept that. And, and there have been a couple. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's two guys uh, that have done a total of about three, ten minute, thirty minutes worth of videos on on how this book is wrong. Uh, I think both of them have bachelor's degrees in basket weaving, and they're arguing with PhDs in, in uh, nuclear physics. Uh, but they they did terrible videos of me because I quoted this book. So 
Uh, but if you if you have something that if you have something, don't say look it up. Do me a favor, provide the link and, and, and help everybody. We want to make sure everybody gets the best possible information. If it means I'm giving out of date or or bad information, please make sure it's corrected and just provide us with a link and show us where, where that's happening. Uh, in both those cases last night, that did happen. They both supported their, their uh, corrections with facts. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Please do that. Uh, that's more important. Let me see. I, I can't read that far with these. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, then what, what has happened is since since uh, the, the late 90s, we've kind of divided up. We used to call it NBC confusing because of the radio, uh, the television company, but we call it Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Warfare, NBC Warfare. And uh, then when we after Chernobyl, after Fukushima, after a couple other nuclear incidents that wasn't an a, a direct attack, uh, we kind of separated out radiological. Uh, so now we changed it. So instead of NBC, now it's referred to uh, by people in the profession as CBRN. Chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear um, exposure. So we're only going to be focusing the next couple weeks on the uh, nuclear, and, and we can throw radiological into there because it's going to have some of the, a lot of the same properties. Uh, but we're primarily going to be focusing on nuclear. We're not going to be talking about radio. I mean, uh, chemical or biological, but we can talk about those at a different time. Um, you know, those are, are the G series, the, the V series of uh, agents uh, that you've seen, sarin, anthrax, and all these other different kinds of agents that, you, that have been weaponized. Smallpox by the British against the Native Americans. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that, that were used. Um, okay, let me see. So uh, by all through all of my CBRN training, this is current courtesy. Uh, talking, Kearney talking here. <clears throat> so all through all of my CBRN training, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, all of the focus was always on anthrax is 35% lethal, or Ebola would be 65% le lethal, or weaponized smallpox would be over 85% lethal and higher. It has always shown how lethal it was. Nuclear weapons are the big scary. Uh, the greatest threat to human life on the planet is one or two things. Number one, the eventual asteroid hitting it ten, in 10 minutes from now to tens of millions of years from now, or two, a simple virus. We never thought in our wildest imagination of a concept that someone or a country would make a 0.5% to 1% lethal virus and l release it on the whole world to destabilize countries for other purposes. You know what he's talking about there. Uh, he also gets into talking about Fukushima. He also talks a little bit about uh, Chernobyl. For those of you who don't speak Russian, by the way, uh, Chernobyl is a cognate. Uh, so Cherno, Chorny, is the Russian word for black. Uh, so it's C-H-E-R-N-O. And uh, But it can also mean the devil, okay? And uh, which is short, C-H-E-Y-O. Uh, that's an E with two dots over it. Uh, Chor. Short uh, RT, C H O R T, basically, um, and that that means the devil. So that's from the the verb or from the noun chor, uh, chorni or adjective chorni, which is black. So cherno is basically a uh, an adverbial form, and then the second part of that word is buit, b y t, soft side, miachis uh, is what it's called in Russian. So buit is the verb to be. So uh, in the past tense, buit is buil, ya buil, uh, ti buil, uh, on buil, muy buili, uh, ana buila. Um, so anyhow, you know, buil is the, buit is, is, is the, uh, the, the root form of the verb. So cherno buil translates literally to it was black or it was dark. What a prophetic name, don't you think? Uh, something else. Um, okay, so let's get into chapter one, the dangers from nuclear weapons, myths and uh, facts. So I've got these turned into banners in, in preparation for this discussion, believe it or not. So let's get up here to the top and I'm going to have to turn on my mouse again because for some reason it does not like for me to maneuver around 
in here without the mouse. Come on. Come on, mouse connect. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Oops, we got a comment. Let me see what the comment is. Oh, listen to Grandma. Welcome. No, you're not too late. You're, you're fine. You're fine. Okay, so the myth, the fallout. Uh, fallout from radiation from a nuclear war would poison the air in all parts of the environment. Well, when you consider the total number of nuclear uh, test uh, explosions that we've had around the world, and one of the largest actually uh, was on a, uh, an island just north of, uh, on, on the northern coast of, of Russia. <clears throat> and, uh, but uh, I mean, that was the largest explosion ever, and that was an airburst. So when you take a look at all the stuff that we've already blown up, we should have blown up the earth. If, that, if, if this myth were true, we would have already blown up the earth several times over. Uh, take a look at the airbursts that we did in Bikini Atoll. And we basically sank a, you know, several ships trying to find out the dangers of, of a nuclear blast over a fleet uh, anchored. In, and so if this were the case, if the, the fallout radiation from nuclear war uh, would pollute the air in all parts of the environment forever and ever to come, we would already be succumbed to it. You know, that's uh, just the way it is because, uh, um, you know, and, and there were several movies. Uh, one movie I remember when I was a kid, uh, the theme song to it, by the way, was Walking, Waltzing Matilda. Uh, and it's, it's an Australian song about a vagabond. But uh, that, so anyhow, we, we sang that in school because of the movie that was in our, in our singing at, at uh, fourth or fifth grade when the movie came out. Uh, but the story is about a nuclear, a, a U.S. submarine that surfaces somehow or other. It's got women on board. Uh, but anyhow, it surfaces and the whole earth has been destroyed. And it, the only people left alive are the people in this uh, submarine. Uh, and so they have to restart uh, the world because uh, the, the world has been totally consumed by nuclear uh nuclear warfare, but that, that won't happen. Okay. So the first thing we have to understand is, is, is the basis of um, basically an air burst versus a ground burst versus a subterranean or subwater burst. Okay. So you have above the ground, on the ground, or below ground. Below ground, chances are nothing's going to happen. Most of the blast and radioactivity is going to be contained. They may have a little bit of a radioactive signature at surface, depending upon how, how, um, deep they did that uh, blast. Uh, you can go to there are portions of Nevada uh, where you can actually look. It's just west of Area 51, uh, but you can actually see the holes in the ground from where they did subterranean nuclear blasts. And uh, so that was they had that going on from the 1940s uh, up until almost the 70s and 80s. Uh, so there have been thousands of, of uh, subterranean blasts. <clears throat> the next one is a surface blast. Okay. We define a surface blast as when the fireball, okay, so you have the explosion, you have that big fireball. If the fireball comes in contact with the earth, that's where you're going to have radioactive fallout because that fireball is part of that radioactive process, uh, the fusion or fission, whichever type of process they're using. And that anything that's contained inside of that fireball becomes radioactive. So if it touches the earth, it's going to, basically turn the earth into glass, little bitty pebbles and everything else. It's going to take those, superheat those, and throw them up into the air. So that's part of that mushroom cloud. Now, just because it's a mushroom cloud does not mean it was a surface burst. But you can also have mushroom clouds from air bursts like we did over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So as long as that, bu that, that ball of fire does not come down and touch the earth, then there is no, there is a very limited danger of any kind of nuclear uh, fallout. Now there is direct radiation. It's going to emanate rays, okay, uh, as a result of the explosion itself, the nuclear explosion itself. But that's going to be just, you know, instantaneous almost. It's not going to uh, uh, turn anything else ra radioactive. It, it will harm any living tissue that it encounters. Uh, but, you know, we're going to go over a formula about that here in, in, in the near future. So the air burst is going to be twice as effective heat-wise, uh, destructive, uh, explosive-wise as a ground burst. But it will not have the residual 
fallout over an area as will the ground burst. It's going to take part of that earth, uh, make it radioactive, put it up in the air. Then as it cools, that radioactive plume, you, so you're going to look at where the wind is blowing and that, that, that stuff that's up to 40 miles high in the atmosphere, as it cools, it becomes heavier. So it's going to be just like a sandstorm where that stuff starts falling back down to earth. That's the radioactive fallout that we're talking about. Some of it may be too small to see, uh, but it is a solid matter that can be filtered away from things. That's why when I did the uh, uh, discussion about getting yourself the pre uh, prepared uh, personal protective equipment, that all you need is a cheapo um, poncho, all you want to do is keep that stuff off of you. It Nothing, <laughs> we're going to get into how you can do it later, but there's no clothing that you're going to have. There's no no $100 Kydex suit. There's no $5,000 mop suit. There is no $1 um, uh, poncho that is going to protect you from the radioactivity of that fallout. The sole purpose of per personal protective equipment at this point, two purposes, both of them are to basically keep the radioactive dust off of your body and out of your lungs. That's all we want to do. Keep that off your body, out of your lungs, so you can quickly get rid of anything that you have that has captured that, get rid of it, and then you can get into a safe area where now you can protect yourself from the radioactivity, okay? So if you discard all that dust and leave it outside and you go inside into a safe area, you should be relatively free from any kind of radioactive fallout. Somebody put page 11. I think that's where I am. Yes, Thank you, Cats and Prepping. You're fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, hello, Holly Ivins. Welcome. And who else? Uh, is Lori? Oh, hi, Lori. Lori had her live one earlier today. She's doing a lot better. Uh, she's looking pretty good, too. Um, so I was on her live. I watched her live here earlier today. Um, okay. So that's that's that one right there. Um Let's go into the next one, which is, um, so we talked about air burst versus a ground burst. And then down at the bottom of, uh, where is it? He talks about this. I believe it's on page, um, yeah, I'm on page 13 now. Um, so we're going to talk about the number uh, 450 rads is enough to kill 50% of the population. So when, when they say it's enough to kill 50% of the population, what that means is there's a 50% survivability rate uh, if you've been exposed to 450 rads. So about half the people who have that kind of exposure uh, will die uh, as a result of the exposure. Now, some people, it may take a lot longer. Some people, it may take a lot shorter. Some people, depending upon your body, you know, remember all of our bodies are different. Some people may take it only 400, some may take 500. But the theory is that if you get 450 rads, that's enough to, for 50% of the people to have received a lethal dose of it. <clears throat> um, so one of the things we need to talk about is, is how do you protect yourself from nuclear radiation? Well, there's three things. Number one is distance, number two is time, and number three is mass. So the further away you are from, a, uh, from an explosion, okay? So one of the rules we were taught in the military is hold your thumb out. If you can hold your thumb out, if your thumb can cover the uh, uh, mushroom when you're looking at it, holding your arm straight out, then you are probably far enough away where you're not going to have any residual blast or heat effects from that explosion. Um, however, if, it, if, if it's bigger than your thumb, duck. and Don't look at it anymore uh, because the heat and the, and the concussive effects could be dangerous. Um, so one of the things we have to take a look at, and I want to use the example of, of a sprinkler. If any of you have one of those sprinklers that has the fan setting on it, so you can have the, the, the water kind of fanning out like this. That's basically what happens with a nuclear explosion. So you've got this nuclear explosion here. You've got this fan. Or think of it like shooting a shotgun. You've got all these pellets, right? So the closer you are, the greater concentration you're going to have of those pellets 
or the water from that water hose hitting you. The further away you are, those are going to spread out as they get further and further away from the shotgun or from the hose, and you aren't going to have the full effects that you would if you were up closer. So we call this the law of the inverse square. So um, if you take the distance that you are away from something measured in meters or kilometers, uh, and then you just over, so you're going to say, I am one uh, 1,000 kilometers or 1,000 meters away from the source. So one over 1,000 squared is the amount of radiation you will receive if you had at, at that distance compared to if you had been standing right there next to it, if that makes sense. So if I'm four kilometers away, I'll receive one sixteenth of what I would have received if I were standing right next to it. If I'm a half a kilometer away, uh, I will receive one fourth of what I would have received if I had been close to it. So that's the law of inverse square. Uh, the second one is time because all radioactive matter has a radioactive half-life. So uh, we have short life and long life uh, radioactivity. Uranium-235 is basically a short-lived uh, half-life. And uh, I'm not, I've got Maggie trying to, let me, let me answer her here real quick. Um, she's trying to send me some stuff and trying to do research on your post. Uh, Let me tell her I'm on a live right now. About nuclear survival skills. Okay, so I've answered Maggie. Maybe she can find us and she'll join us. Um, so anyhow, so the second one is time. So the more time that you are separating between the explosion and the arrival of that at you, the less strength it's going to have. You know, like the fizz in a Coca-Cola, uh, it loses its fizz over time. Well, same thing with radioactivity. It loses its fizz over time, and that's measured in a half-life. So let's say that the half-life is uh, one hour. So that means that, that if it hits me at 450 rentgens at hour zero at explosion, then at hour one, it's going to be half of that, or 225. At hour two, it's going to be half of that again, so it's going to be 112 uh, Rankins. At hour three, it's going to be half of that again, so it's going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 56 Rankins. And then hour four, it'll be down to 28. So notice how it keeps going down half every hour from whatever is left over. So that's your second valuable uh, protection from nuclear blast. And, and that is the fact that you've got time. How far, how far away or how long is it going to take that to hit you? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we say uh, during the Cold War, during, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we told people probably your best chance of surviving is going to be stay inside your shelter for two weeks. Because at the end of two weeks, you would only have something like 0.025% of the radioactive levels that you would have had at the beginning of the explosion, okay? Third thing that is going to be critical to you is what's called mass. And so there's a real good uh, um, graph that they show here on page 14, and it shows the amount of gamma radiation uh, and how much it penetrates. So they've got a real good uh, formula on the next page, on page... Um, or the page number 14, and it talks about layers of 3.6 inches of dirt. Uh, so a la one layer of, of 3.6 inches of dirt reduces the radioactivity by one thirty-second. okay, because it's a being absorbed in the dirt. So uh, 31 30 seconds still makes it through, but you're reducing it by one thirty-one thirty one thirty uh, second. Uh, so now... What happens if you have five layers? Okay, well, that's going to be that one over 32 squared, right? So uh, if you have one layer, you're going to reduce it by two times. Two layers is four. Three layers is eight. So you keep going up. If you have 12 layers of dirt at 3.6 inches, so that's, let's call it 
36, 48 inches. So if you got four feet of dirt between you and where the radioactivity is, you have reduced the amount of radiation you're going to be exposed to by 4,096 4, times. You'll only receive one four thousandth of the amount of radiation as if you had been right next to it. Let's check comments. Looks like there's a whole bunch building up. Uh, Maggie, there you are. All right, so she did join us. Great, fantastic. Uh, okay, so potassium, let's talk about potassium iodide. And make sure, and, and the, the chemical symbol for that is Ki. You also have KIO, and both of those are effective. All you're doing is protecting your thyroid, okay? Uh, so the other organs, now your thyroid is the one that's going to be the first and probably the most uh, attractive to radiation. So it'll concentrate there first. So it's going to prolong you a little bit. All of your human organs are subject to uh, radiation. So yes, potassium iodide is, is a fantastic thing, but don't think that if you take a KI or a KIO pill uh, that you're immune to radiation. All you're doing is protecting your thyroid. As a matter of fact, uh, physicians say that over age 65, uh, the effectiveness of KI, KIO is negligent. Uh, you probably are not going to have um, any benefit from it if you're over 65. Um, so uh, let's see here. Okay, so now he's talking about RADS. Once again, he's talking about that rule that we talked about, uh, the 325. No, we haven't talked about it yet. 325 and 100 rule. So let me get here. Uh, magic numbers, 325 and, and 100. So Maggie, we are, we are using the Nuclear War Survival Skills book, uh, and that's what we're, we're discussing. Um, so... Uh, OSHA radiation yearly limits for nuclear workers is a lot less. Uh, you usually don't want to get more than three rads per day. So when I was doing uh, HR work for a nuclear uh, power plant, um, yeah, we didn't even want them to get three rads a day. Uh, so, the, but the safety limit right now is you can probably safely accumulate three rads a day and dissipate that over time. Uh, the next one is, the next magic number is 25 rads. If you receive 25 rads all at one time, uh, then that has a 1% lethal dose. Uh, so what that means that 1% of the people who receive 100 rads will more than likely die as a result of that exposure. Uh, and then the third one, uh, let me see, 25 rads. Yeah. And then at 100, I'm sorry, 25 rads. Let me read it. Okay, that's going to make it a lot easier. If you receive 25 rads or more at once, uh, that became their limit. If you get 25 rads from an event, you really want to stay in your shelter and hide, get the lowest continuing radiation dose possible for days, even weeks, but I can't advise on medical information in this book. At 100 rads exposure, uh, then you have a lethal dose 1%, where 1% of the people who receive 100 rads will die. Uh, then it goes up to uh, where you have 100% lethality, which is basically 250 rads, okay? Then it goes into a little bit more about the, the air burst versus ground burst. Uh, he talks a little bit about different myths and the facts uh, on Hiroshima and some of the things that we have strategically seen. Um, let me just catch up with... Uh, okay, so that's the three. Well, I did all this ahead of time. 25 reds at one time is the limit, and then 100 is a do fatal dose for 1%. So mass of 3.6 inches of dirt reduces radiation by 132nd and then you want to continue to add that. So ideally, you want to have somewhere in the vicinity of about uh, two to four feet of, of dirt between you and the radioactivity. Uh, now remember, when you are sheltering in your home, that that fallout, that dust is going to accumulate on your roof. It's going to accumulate and pile up uh, next to where the ground meets your structure. 
So the further you can get inside the interior of the house and equidistance from the walls, as well as equidistance from the ceiling, the better off you're going to be. So that's why you're going to see in multi-story buildings, they recommend you go to this, like if it's a three-story building, they're going to strongly recommend you go to the second story because you're going to have the radiation from the fallout on the roof. You're going to have the radiation from the fallout on the ground. So the safest place to be a little bit further away from both is in the middle floor or the second floor of that building. <clears throat> um, okay, so... Uh, so it, it's not just the radiation from the particles that is outside. What is very detrimental to the human body is having radioactive particles on your clothes or skin. And what is even worse is breathing them into your lungs or drinking or eating the particles with your food or water. So that's why we say, you know, th that that PPE that I told you about, that I that one minute video I did, uh, get an N95 mask, that's enough to filter out 95 to 97% of all the dust particles that you can possibly ingest uh, with radioactive fallout. You also don't want to get it into your uh, eyes or your ears or your nose. So you want to make sure you have goggles and cover your ears with anything. That's why that poncho uh, with something that, to seal it down, goggles and a mask is going to be so critical. You want to keep it off your skin. You want to keep it out of your eyes. You want to keep it out of your lungs. Now, if you can invest in a slightly better mask when it has, you know, ceiling and, and goggles and, and air breathing, uh, more power to you. I, I, that, that, that's great. You're going to increase your chances of survivability. But, <coughs> but you will have great chances of survivability if you just get that $1 poncho, uh, gloves, booties, um, goggles, and an N95 mask, okay? So that is sufficient to protect you from the dust. Now, remember the dust is radioactive and you don't have any mass separating you from the radioactivity. All we're doing is keep the dust off your body. So what you're going to do is take, when you do, they call it doffing, D-O-F-F-I-N-G, doffing. When you doff your protective equipment, you want to do it in such a way that you aren't stirring up that, those radio, that radioactive dust. So that's why I carry a pocket knife in my pocket. Another good reason to have one is what you can do is reach up and just cut your, your poncho off so that you can kind of layer it back and then take your top off. The very last two things you want to take off are going to be your gloves and your mask and eye goggles. Those will be the last two things you take off because in case you do stir any dust up as you're taking this stuff off, as you're doffing this stuff, you don't want any of that dust to come up into your eyes or nose or mouth. Okay, so uh, that's doffing. So consider how do you get that stuff off your body? How do you get those protective layers off your body without stirring up the dust and getting it inside your nose or inside your eyes or anything like that? Okay, so now we're talking about an airburst, and the main dangers from the airburst are blast effects. So, well, actually, there's there's two. There's the blast effects, and there's also heat radiation. Um, and it's the thermal pulses of intense light and heat radiation and the very penetrating initial nuclear ra radiation from the fireball. So that gives us three things. It says, it says the, um, the main, oh, main dangers. Uh, so yeah, so you've got that initial um, burst of radiation. You've got alpha, beta, gamma. Okay, alpha rays can be stopped by a sheet of paper. Okay, beta rays are probably going to be stopped by your skin and your clothing. Gamma rays are the ones we want to be most concerned with. Those are going to penetrate all kinds of stuff. That's where you want to have two to four feet of concrete, earth, whatever, six feet of water. I mean, there's all different kinds of things that you can get that are going to prepare you and, and reduce that radioactivity from getting towards you. The heat and light, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you are staring at the area where the explosion happens, 95% uh, of the people who, who looked at the uh, fireball were, went blind. If you take a look at the crew of the Enola Gay, for example, they all had special welding sunglasses uh, that they wore, and they were facing away from the blast. They were afraid of, of what the blast might do to them and, and blind them as far as being able to land. And uh, so, you know, so that's that danger of that, that, that intense light. Well, that intense light is also extremely hot. Uh, so it causes fireballs. And, and especially in Hiroshima, 95% of the structures were made of wood. So it caused this intense fire 
uh, down on the ground and everything burnt away. Uh, there are actually, you know, if you think of um, Mount Ves Vesuvius and what it did to, uh, what was the name of that place? In Italy. Um, anyhow, uh, you know, they have where, where they show that there, there were bodies just melted and, and the chiroplastic flow was around them and it just melted the body that was inside of it. Same thing. There were there, there are uh, shadows of human beings on the ground in Nagasaki and Hiroshima where the, the, the intense light and heat basically melted the body away. But that produced enough of a shadow where it burned that shadow into the ground at both of those explosions. So your three things you want to be, and, and the third one, of course, is you got the blast. Uh, so just like with any kind of an explosion, you've got that initial blast going out, but it also creates a vacuum. So, you know, when you, when you push from here, everything goes this way, you're creating a vacuum here. So after it's pushed everything this way, something's got to come back and fill that vacuum. So you have a, a returning um, shock wave. So you've got two shock waves, the initial one going out and then a returning one to fill that uh, void that uh, uh, where, where the explosion originally had happened. Gosh, I'm way behind on comments. Let me catch up here and see where we are. I can't see what these on there. I have to need them from my book. Okay. Uh, Freaxorus, welcome and thank you. I, I, I mentioned you earlier at the uh, beginning and, and thank you very much for your uh, teaching me about, I think it was you who taught me about the FDR uh, monument in uh, DC yesterday. Thank you very much for that. I, I did not know about that at all. Um, So, uh, great question. Let me let me get up here and see. Okay, so game. Uh, Josie Hickman says best to have a Geiger counter in your preps. Yes, I have two of them. I have one in my EDC. I have another one in a Faraday bag, just in case this one goes because of an EMP or CMP. So personally, I have two. Um, you can get them for $84, $85. Um, I'll, I'll put the links to the, to the ones I have in the show notes tomorrow uh, if you're interested. Um, because I think Amazon sells both of the ones that I have. Um, two to four feet of, of um, dirt in an underground dugout shelter. Absolutely. Absolutely. You want to be underground. Uh, and they recommend six feet. You know, that that's going to be your optimum, but uh, you don't get anything, any additional benefit after six feet. But yeah, six, if you can get six feet between you and, and six feet of dirt between you and it, that's great. Or three inches of lead, uh, whichever is easier. Uh, yes, for both, actually. And, and this is also counting on the fact that you're going to have a concrete... <coughs> or some other uh, impervious um, roof. So that's going to have, you're going to have your roof, whatever it is, concrete, steel, or something like that. So that's another barrier. Then you're going to have at least three feet of, of uh, earth on top of it. That's the recommendation. Absolutely. So little lone prepper says she can't remember where she heard or read. Uh, water cannot be irradiated. Is that true? Yes and no. Uh, so, Remember, we talked about the fireball where the fission or fusion takes place. If the water is present where that fission or fusion explosion is taking place, yes, it can become irradiated. Because what you're, what you're doing is you're introducing new neutrons or new electrons into that atom. Okay. So, uh, however, they also have a very short, short uh, uh, half life. And usually they will, they will boil off, okay? Now, the second part of that is if you have radioactive fallout, that dust that comes down from the sky, remember the dust is radioactive. Now, if it gets into water, and it says it explicitly right here on page 16, uh, column 2, paragraph 4, the last two sentences, Water containing dissolved radioactive elements and compounds can be made safe for drinking by simply filtering it through dirt. Okay. Now you can get some other, you can get uh, filters. 
Seychelle, S-E-Y-C-H-E-L-L-E-S, uh, has a water bottle. And with that water bottle, they have a, uh, a filter that is guaranteed to eliminate any kind of radioactive uh, water. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with their solution, okay? We're talking about you have a bottle, you fill it up with, with uh, uh, dirty water. It's got this thing that goes down inside, and then it's got this kind of like little black filter that sits down and in the middle. So as you drink your water, all the radioactivity is being concentrated into that filter, and you're getting pure water out. Well, guess what? You now have a radioactive filter that you're going to put on your hip. And I, I not something I want to do. I don't want to keep a radioactive bottle on my in my uh, in my bug out bag. So uh, so I don't have that. I'm just going to filter it another way, you know. And uh, but I would say that probably if you use something like a good coffee filter with some other things like maybe activated charcoal or sand and pour your water through it, then you're probably going to be 95% safe to drink it, okay? So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, it's also one of my pet peeves is that people think that the water is going to become irradiated because it has uh, fallout or dust in it, which is not true. Uh, it's the dust that is radioactive that is in suspension in the water. So if you can get rid of that dust, then you're good to go, okay? Ideally, absolutely correct. So I, I did a video about a year ago uh, on my plans. And one of my plans is I bought, I think you can get them at Walmart for around $20. There's a camping three and a half gallon um, shower, outdoor camping shower. And that's more than sufficient. So my backyard, my back porch, okay, I've got some tarps and I'm going to basically tarp off my back porch. And then I'm going to tarp off another pathway through it so that the first one, before you even get underneath the overall overhang and everything else, you're going to rinse off with a shower. Uh, and, and you don't want to scrub. You just want to rinse. You're going to rinse off your poncho and everything else. Okay. Then you're going to step further away from the house. You're going to doff that, put it into a contaminated bucket. Uh, so I've got a 35-gallon trash can. And all of your soiled stuff, all your contaminated radioactive stuff is going to go in there. Then you're going to come on around. You're going to get totally undressed. And then there will be clean clothes there for you to get into. If you want to, you could do a secondary shower where now you're showering your body. Uh, that would only be advisable if uh, you think that you may have had areas that were exposed to the, uh, to the chemicals, uh, to, to, the, to the dust, the radioactive fallout. Uh, but you don't want to scrub. You just want to rinse it off. Most of it will rinse off and just go off. You want to do that as far away. You want to have it the furthest areas away from you because, remember, you're washing off those radioactive particles, so now you're going to have a concentration of radioactive particles in that suspension that goes off your patio or whatever. So I have, I have it all planned out. I'm going to have my backyard uh, basically into a decontamination zone uh, where I'm going to put my, my doffed equipment uh, two showers, and then come back inside and get clean and everything else. And so that's kind of the way I'm going to do it. So I have two different shower systems. The question becomes one of how do I go back out and refill that uh, shower system? Because remember, that area is going to have a little bit of radio radioactivity in it now. I think I'll be safe because of very short periods of time. Uh, so maybe what I might even have is a third one that I keep in a different area where I'll keep it filled and then replace the other two as they get used. I don't know. Um, I, I don't have it perfected yet, but, you know, that's kind of where I am. Um, yes. So Theophorus is in agreement with me. Yeah, that uh, it's not the, the water itself will only become radioactive if it's actually inside that fireball and, and a chance. Remember, that's that intense heat. It's even hotter than the sun. So if it becomes if you got radioactive water inside that fireball, it's gone. It's steam. It's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. 
Um, now, what they do, remember that w when you have a uh, uh, nuclear power plant, what they're doing is they're superheating the water, okay, as it goes through that nuclear uh, fusion and the heat, the superheat. It turns it into steam. That steam goes into a turbine. Then it goes, uh, then after it leaves that, it goes into the cooling towers and everything else. Well, you got two different sets of water. One, you've got the water that's being heated by the actual nuclear reaction. So now you've got this hot steam and it goes in a loop, okay? It comes back into the nuclear reactor. That steam then goes through pipes that go through the other water. Now we've got a second set of water in a second tank. And so the steam from the first water is, is actually uh, heating the water in the second tank. And that's what's driving the turbines, okay? So any chances of that first water becoming radioactive uh, because it was close to that uh, fusion-fission reaction, the chances of it actually contaminating the other water is slim because it's contained inside these pipes and you're just getting the heat from it and not necessarily the actual interaction of the water. Now, what they also do is they take barium and they will add barium, chemical barium, uh, to both of the water systems because, so that to reduce the total amount of uh, uh, exposure to, to radiation. And so a lot of times if you're, oh, I'm going to say within five miles of a nuclear power plant, sometimes in just the right conditions, you'll see this white stuff coming down. That's the barium that's resolidifying. And, uh, but that's safe from uh, radio radiation. That's not, it's not radioactive in any way. It's quite, if anything, it's ex the exact opposite. It's going to protect you from radiation. Okay. Uh, they're very close to a nuclear sub base. <laughs> yeah, well, let's just hope they don't hit the subs. So uh, Sean says he, he purchased the cheap shoot shoot uh, the cheap suit to protect him from nuclear and radiological uh, fallout. Yes. Okay. Uh, when you get uh, where you want to have more expensive suits is when you get into uh, chemical or biological, which is not what we're talking about tonight. Uh, you know, there are times even with biological, you see those in, in all these movies where they have, you know, like, uh, what was it, Nation Z, Z Nation or whatever, where they had that biological agent that he had to give himself a shot with. And uh, you saw all these guys with the helmets and those have self-contained breathing apparatus. They don't even trust the, uh, the filters. Uh, so that's where you want the more expensive suit. That's where you want the self-contained breathing apparatus. As far as nuclear fallout, you just want to keep that stuff off of you. Uh, and, and the more uh, non-permeable uh, the stuff is, the better off you're going to be because it'll be easier to get it off. Okay. Uh, now, if you, if you don't have a, a, a cheapo poncho or something like that to keep the radiation off of you, just understand you're going to have to get rid of all the clothing that you're wearing when you go through decontamination before you get into an area. You don't want to carry any of that contamination into the shelter with you, okay? Uh, let me see here. Pompeii, thank you, Josie. Yeah, I knew somebody would remember it. Um, Let me see here. Yeah, so the Tyvek painters cover, coveralls, uh, basically what you're doing is that's going to protect. So there's three levels of protection, right? You got the nuclear. Now remember, nothing you wear, nothing you wear, I want to emphasize this, is going to protect you from the radiation from the fallout. All we want to do is keep the fallout from becoming embodied contact with your body or into your body. Uh, we just want to keep that as far away from your body as possible. So that's why we have ponchos, Tyvek suits, and everything else, just to keep that from coming in contact with your body. It's not protecting you from the radiation. You want to get, you want to, get to a safe area. You want to doff that stuff that has the radiation, the fallout, as soon as possible. Uh, don't think you're going to be safe wearing it for a while. So that's let's call that level A, okay? The next level is going to be chemical protection, okay? So chemical protection are going to be uh, usually uh, inhalants and things like that. In World War I, you had mustard gas. Uh, in, in World War II, we had VX. Um, 
and, and GB and, and all these other different uh, uh, blood agents, blister agents, uh, sarin, all these nerve agents and everything else. Uh, uh, so, so those you want a, a little bit more protection than what you have with the radioactive, right? Because they can kind of kind of get caught up in wind and everything else and, and you know circulate and everything. So you want a little bit more protection than you would with just straight fallout. Then you got the biological, you want even a higher level of protection for biological than what you did with the chemical. Uh, so remember, remember the pictures of, of the, the soldiers in World War I. They had a gas mask and gloves. And that was what their protection was against blister agents and blood agents and things like that. Um, uh, let me see. Yeah, um, yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, Maggie says, uh, dirt, sand, charcoal, for sure. Um, putting it through two sets of filtration systems. I, I did a video for the 30 days of prepping, and I talked about life in a non-flowing water situation. <clears throat> and so I talked about my water purification. So I have, <clears throat> I, I have three different jugs. Let's call them jugs for, for lack of a better word. One is dirty water. The next one is semi-clean water. And then the third one is clean water. So what I'll do is let's take my, my I have a 350-gallon uh, uh, rain catchment system. So it's got burb poop in it. It's got asphalt from the shingles. It's got everything else in it, right? So that's dirty water out there. That's my dirty water. Now, I can't really work with that. So what I'm going to do is I've got a hose attached to it. I open the spigot, pour it into a dirty water container. Now I take that dirty water container and I'm going to pre-filter it. So I'm going to put it in, I'm going to move that from the dirty water container into a semi-dirty container. So what I'm doing there is I basically have a pour over coffee system. So it's, 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 it's a cone with a coffee filter on it and some activated charcoal. And all I'm doing is pouring the water on that. I'm separating out all the solid contaminants. That then becomes my semi-dirty water. Now I take my semi-dirty water and I'm going to put that through a filtration system. Uh, I use Alexa Pure, which is a clone of the Big Berkey. I have a Water Filter Pro, uh, Survivor Filter Pro. I have three of those. Uh, I, I just think that's the best one on the market. And so then I'm going to take that from uh, semi-dirty to clean. Okay. And then when it gets into the clean stage, that's where I'm going to consume it. Uh, so that's how I'm going to prepare my water. Uh, regardless of whether it's radiated with, with fallout or anything else, those are the three steps I'm going to do. I am uh, a friend of mine, Morgan, uh, Rogue Preparedness, fantastic channel, strongly recommend it. Uh, she did a review today. She and her husband bought a distill, distillation, water distillation kit, and she spent $100 on Amazon, and she has a water distillation system. So what you're doing is basically, excuse me, you're boiling the water, and then condensing it so that you're getting pure water and, and all the other contaminants are left in the uh, in the distillation pot. So uh, uh, that's another thing you might want to consider if you think you're going to run out of filters or anything like that. Let me get down here. Let's see. Uh... Actually, that's pretty good. Um, so what I do for shoes is uh, at, at Walmart, at, at Sherwin-Williams or anywhere else, uh, you, they have these painter's booties. So it has an elastic top. They fit over your shoes. Uh, then they, they have an elastic top where it's going to be kind of like a tight sock around your feet. And that's what I use for my, uh, to protect my feet. The dust on them, of course, you got the bottom is coming in contact with the earth and everything else. Uh, so, yeah, so that, that's what I use. I, I showed that in that video. Uh, you can get like five pair of them for, for three or four dollars. Uh, but it's a fantastic thing to have. So it's also something you might want to have if you need to venture out after anything happens, uh, just so you don't get your shoes dirty. We use the Asian philosophy here in our house. Uh, when I take a look at the, 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 the amount of crap that's on the ground, people spitting, chewing and spitting, uh, gum, uh, 
animal matter, everything else, and that it gets it put into the streets and spitting and coughing and hacking and everything else. Um, I don't want that in, you know, put into my shoes and then my shoes uh, worn into the house and it rubbing off on my carpet or on my hardwood floors or anything. So we take our shoes off at the door. We don't wear shoes inside our house uh, for that very reason. And so it'll be very easy for us to then put on some kind of a cover over that. Oh my gosh, it's already nine o'clock. We haven't gotten as far as I wanted to. Uh, great idea. Thank you. Great comment. Yeah, you don't want to shampoo, use soap, use hair conditioner, or anything else uh, that is going to cause those that those fallout particles to adhere to your body. So basically, hair conditioner is kind of think of it as being a very loose glue. Uh, so you know it's going to hold things into your hair, and you don't want that dust in being held into your hair. Um, five gallon buckets will do it. Thank you, Cheryl. Oh, by the way, welcome. Uh, Yeah, so so the the, the plastic uh, painter shoe cover shoe booties. Uh, let me see what else. All kinds of great comments. Thank you all so much. I am so lucky. I have the best people on earth followers. Uh, Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Cheryl. Good point. Uh, make sure you have a dosimeter. Uh, so basically what a dosimeter does is that's going to be your personal Geiger counter. On, on, I think they're available on, uh, there, there's, there's a website, KI, the number four, you, uh, KI for you. And he sells, so what happens was when they closed down all of the old, um, um, fallout shelters back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. He got the deal with the government where he could buy all the Geiger counters and all the dosimeters and all that kinds of stuff. So he refurbishes those, calibrate the, calibrates those, and sells those. And uh, so, you know, when you buy the package, you also get a copy of this book. And uh, But anyhow, uh, so, so the radiation, you got radiation survey meters that are going to tell you whether radiation is present or not. Geiger counter is going, you know, that's for high-level doses. Geiger counter is going to give you the count of how many rads there are. And then you have a personal Geiger counter in a sense called a dosimeter. And so what it does is it measures, remember we talked about the 325, 100 rule. So it's got a little, um, they can be either color activated or it can be a bar graph, uh, but it shows you how many rads your body has absorbed because that's how many rads that this little card has absorbed. Sometimes you also see it, kind of like a pin flashlight where you look through it and it'll tell you how much you've absorbed. Uh, but having a personal dosimeter will tell you how much overall radiation your body has absorbed and whether or not you should then seek the, the lowest ground possible and stay away from anything and everything that might have radioactive fallout on it. Um, thank you. Listen to grandma. I appreciate that. Maggie, great suggestion. Once you get inside, make sure you, and, and this has got to be one of your preps you get now. Get plastic sheeting, get masking tape, and uh, get 100 mile an hour tape. So basically what you want to do is this, this window behind me, okay? I want to take that tape. I want to tape it shut with plastic sheeting so that nothing can come in, especially if the window, the glass has been broken. You also want to cover up any inlets or outs, outlets for your air conditioner and your heating system because things are going to be blowing in through there as well. Um, then one of the other things I'm going to do is I'm probably going to cover this. Uh, and Walmart has them. They have blackout curtains for like $14 or $16 a pair. Uh, after you've got this covered with plastic sheeting, cover it with a blackout curtain, okay? And, and that will keep other people from knowing what you're doing inside. So that's just another step of... of uh, uh, protection for you. Um, so, um, what do you do to take up, uh, well, tape, tape up the vents, not take up. Uh, so you're just going to tape them up. 
uh, cover that with plastic sheeting so that th those air conditioner vents, vents, you aren't circulating any kind of radioactive dust. Uh, let me see. I just hit more comments and went way down. Uh, yes, so so Princess Kicking Butt, welcome. Nice to have you aboard. I haven't seen you before, but welcome, welcome, welcome. So yes, uh, th those 60-pound uh, food containers, I have two of them. That's where I keep my dog food. Uh, one here in this pantry and then one in the, in the uh, long-term storage pantry. And uh, they, they do a fantastic job. It's, it's kind of like a PVC uh, is what it's made out of. And it has a screw type uh, lid, but it's really good. The girls go crazy when they hear me opening that screw top lid. They know it's feeding time. Um, okay. That's a great suggestion. I, I have not heard that one before, but it is a fantastic suggestion. Uh, you just make sure you also have a means of, of giving them uh, chlorophyll, which is the, basically the sunlight that they need in order to do that transaction of changing uh, carbon dioxide into oxygen. Uh, because if they don't have the sunlight, so you need artificial sunlight uh, that's going to be able to to uh, keep those plants alive if you're underground or if you everything, like I said, with the, uh, with the, with the blackout curtain. So great suggestion. Thank you for bringing that up, Maggie. Uh, and Princess Kicking Butt says you can also get half inch plywood, cut the size to cover the windows and doors. Uh, true. So, so you want to keep people out and, uh, uh, you also want to keep up the, uh, but I have a feeling if you're in an area, uh, to be totally, uh, to be totally honest, if you're in an area where you're having to stay inside, I have a feeling that most people are probably going to be seeking shelter inside their own homes and rather than coming to yours. Now, two weeks later, that may be a different thing. Uh, but, uh, But, but all in all, yeah, if you, the more secure you can make your home, if you can get, uh, you know, plywood, uh, two by fours, or anything, anything you can get to make your home more secure, I am 100% for. I don't know, Billy. I, I have not seen one. Uh, and by the way, welcome. I have, I have not seen your name before. Uh, I have not seen anything about that. I don't know. Uh, so you've caught me. I, I can't give you any advice there. Uh, I will research it, however, and maybe have an answer for you next week. I've got a fantastic vet. Um, uh, yeah, isn't that the truth? Uh, and and here in this West Texas sun, or Central Texas sun, I should say, I'm from West Texas originally, El Paso. Uh, but uh, uh, here, you know, even the, the blue plastic tarps that I keep over a lot of my stuff, like my extra water bottles and stuff I keep outside, uh, they only last one summer. The, the, the sun is brutal on them. It'll tear that blue plastic, those plastic tarps you get at, uh, um, oh, what's the name of the place? Harbor Freight. I get mine at Harbor Freight, and I know that they're only going to last one summer, uh, and then I have to replace them. Okay, let me see if there's anything else I want to recover here. We're at one hour and 10 minutes. Oh, my gosh. Um, so nuclear winter, um, one of the things that they talk about is the nuclear winter. You know, you've got the things like book of Eli and all these other things. Uh, you've got the Mad Max movies and everything else about the nuclear winter. Um, so that was a theory that was promoted in 1963 to, I'm sorry, 1983 to 1986, I believe it was. Let me get to my notes here. Uh, so the unsurvivable nuclear winter. I just want to talk about this one real quick. So it was a theory from 1982. Uh, it was associated with mutual ass assured destruction, uh, which the author Carl Sagan was uh, promoting. It was a, it, he did it for political reasons. And I'm not so sure it wasn't supported by our government. 
uh, that you know we want to drive the fear into those countries who uh, may have used um, nuclear warfare against us that we talked about mutual assured destruction uh, that would cause the nuclear winter and everything else. So there was there was a group of professors, five of them, and Carl Sagan being number five, uh, called the TAPS. And so from 1983 to 1986, uh, they produced a whole bunch of things in Parade Magazine. Now, Parade Magazine used to be put out every Sunday as an insert in the Sunday version of the newspaper for those of you who came after newspapers. Uh, so that was read by almost everybody. It had, you know, that was the... Uh, uh, the rag sheet of, of all the, the stuff going on in Hollywood and everything else and, and, and recipes and all that kinds of stuff. So everybody read Parade. So that, you know, if you read Parade, you're going to read the Carl Sagan and the TTAPS uh, information about uh, mutual assured destruction. So th it appeared for about four years, 83 to 86, and the authors were R.P. Turco, O.B. Toon, T.P. Ackerman, J.B. Pollock and Carl Sagan, and they just called it T-TAPS. That was the first letter of each of their last names. Uh, so after they got done with that, then we had some non-political uh, journalists and scientists who investigated that and found out that they were full of nuclear dust. No, no, full of poo-poo. There we go. Yeah, they were full of poo-poo, and that really wasn't going to happen. So, um, you know, that's kind of, uh, that has been disproven. Uh, if it were going to happen, it would have already happened because of all the testing that we've already done. So we've already had more nuclear explosions on the face of the earth than the current number of warheads in existence in the, on the earth. So, uh, you know, if, if that were the case, then we would already be there. Okay, so I think that's it. Next week, we'll cover chapters two and three. What questions do you have that are burning that we need to get answered before we close this thing down? Let me grab my Bible. Let me see. So I hear, I see great uh, suggestion with Skoka Oma. So let me see what she had to say. Yeah, so the 3M film was fantastic to protect you from flying glass. There is Muskoka Oma's. You could use a medical grade air purifier. I have the purifier filter Queen Defender. Yes, absolutely. Um, so any kind of a HEPA filter as well would, would do fantastic. I have, uh, I have a HEPA filter in our bedroom, and I also have you know my oxygen concentrator that I sleep with. Uh, so either one of those would be okay. Um, it's funny, the government told us that we needed to do in such an event and where our supplies were in the building, uh, a GOV building. Huh. Well, thank you for being here, Maggie. We greatly appreciate you being here. Um, so there was a while back, back when I had my store, uh, one of our, um, the, this one person that Maggie and I both uh, watched their live, her lives a lot, her son was deployed uh, overseas when, when we had the first uh, initial breakings out of uh, the war and in Europe. And... Uh, uh, Maggie was so generous with her donations to that unit, uh, keeping those guys and their morale so high. So thank you for that, Maggie. We greatly appreciate you for that. Um, okay, so Princess Kicking Butt is getting ahead of it. Uh, she knows the dangers that we're looking at this evening. Uh, so she's already started getting the downstairs taken care of and put some extra screws in each piece of plywood. Uh, Oh, so I see you're doing that as a defensive measure as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, so uh, Book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24, 25, 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you kindly and most importantly, grant us peace. So thank you all so much for being here. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, Theoxorus, I believe it was you. Thank you for turning me on last night. I, I so greatly appreciate it when their knowledge is shared, even if it means correcting me. Uh, but if we get the right information out, that's what's most important. So thank you, Theoxorus, for teaching me about, I think it was you, about the FDR uh, monument in, in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. And thanks to uh, 
uh, Michelle Mitten, prepper, uh, prepper veteran uh, uh, from Michigan, uh, because she enlightened me that I was under the false conception that the, the American Expeditionary Forces were only World War One, and she straightened me out on that. So uh, KI for you is fantastic. Please go there. They have all kinds of information. Uh, strongly recommend it. Okay, so remember, we're all in this together, so we can come out the other side together. Oh, by the way, I did put out a short today on, and, and I linked it to a guy, one of my favorite uh, uh, chefs, uh, cooks, whatever, uh, on how to use your prepare your, your freeze dried foods to make chicken a la king. And uh, so the, I've got the uh, the components on the short. I've got a link to his video on how you can fix your own chicken a la king in a post-apocalyptic world. So make sure you catch that short. Do me a favor, hit the like and subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. So remember, we're all in this together so we can come out the other side together. Please be kind, polite, and respectful to each other because togetherness is the key, and we're going to get through this together. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.